Talking about normal physiologic labor in birth today, um, Dr. Salvo um, said not to get into the abnormal labor because she had addressed some of that already. So we're just gonna do these two topics instead. Um, so I just wanna start out talking about normal physiologic labor as part as um, the process of respectful maternity care. The World Health Organization put out a lot of information about giving um, respectful maternity care, and I think that's important when we're talking about recognizing normal physiologic labor and respecting normal labor. Um, so the WHO in that same um, um, uh, statement expanded their goals beyond just survival of the mom-baby couplet, but ensuring that they're, they thrive and they achieve their full potential for um, health and well-being. So they're talking mostly about ensuring that giving birth is not only safe, which is our first priority, of course, um, but ensuring that it's a positive experience for women and their families. And I'm sure a lot of you who have been practicing now for a little while have had the experience where you've had a woman come to you um, because from a different provider, it's maybe her second or third baby because she felt like she was not respected in her birth. So um, the World Health executive did make an executive summary statement which i won't read to you but essentially talks about recognizing the normality of labor and childbirth um oops sorry and um that the increasing medicalization of childbirth tends to undermine women's own ability to give um capability to give birth and can really negatively impact their uh, experience um so again, just this, the kind of key points, I think we're very good at Sinai about having respectful maternity care, especially when we're talking about communication, when we're talking about um, joint decision-making with patients, but I think that we also need to respect that natural labor process. Um, and then there's a couple other um, uh, statements in here, like I said, that you can read on your own. So definition of normal labor, um, the World Health Organization, American College of Nurse Midwives and Royal College of Midwives essentially all have it as being the same definition. So spontaneous and onset and progressing without intervention. Labor is occurring at term, so 37 to 42 weeks with the baby being um, born spontaneously in the vertex position with normal blood loss. The mom and the baby are staying together um, afterwards for skin to skin, so directly on her chest. Um, the labor results in a vaginal birth with normal blood loss and breastfeeding begins right away. ACOG recently, um, uh, more recently, did a definition of physiologic childbirth. They don't call it normal, they call it physiologic, which um, essentially is the same thing, spontaneous labor and birth at term without the use of pharmacologic and or medical interventions for labor stimulation or pain management throughout labor and birth. So this does not include things like antibiotics does not in, um, interfere with the natural um, spontaneous labor, but things like epidurals, pain medication, rupture membranes, etc. So again, all of these different midwifery associations, because I'm of course a midwife and that's what I look at, essentially talk about um, it's spontaneous, it's progression is spontaneous, it promotes um, things that they're doing, promote the um, continuation of spontaneous labor, and it um, results in um, two of the big things is newborn transition and early initiation of breastfeeding. So one thing I think that we need to understand is the basic physiology of labor and why our interventions can really impact spontaneous labor. So we know that in the last weeks of pregnancy, there's increasing amounts of prolactin and oxytocin and they start to ripen the cervix and the uterus becomes increasingly sensitive. Um, and then with the onset of labor, the uterus muscle responds to that release of oxytocin, which causes painful contractions. As women cope with the increasing um, painful contractions, more oxytocin is released, um, therefore making better more effective contractions and continuing the labor process. If she's in a safe environment where she feels um, supported, we'll see that she gets a natural um, release of beta endorphins for pain management would help her to cope and then allows that, can, that cycle to continue into normal physiologic labor. If we have a woman who feels stressed or that, is, that physiology is interrupted, that can impact both the release of uh, oxytocin and the catecholamines and can stop or even slow the labor progress. 
I know that there are many times where we've had women who come into triage who've been contracting every couple minutes at home. They really feel like they're in active labor. And then we get there and they're only contracting every six minutes or something, um, you know, like that to where like they feel like their labor, labor has really been um, interrupted. And that's a normal physiologic response. Um, so I think that it's reasonable when we're in triage and we're looking at patients that if they're telling you their contractions were every two minutes at home and they have a paper or an app that says they've been every two minutes, I think it's really important that we give them time to kind of prove that this really was a false labor that's stopping versus this interruption of the normal physiology of labor. And then I just have another example down below um, of medical interventions. Um, so for example, if we give a woman an epidural and that takes away all of her pain, that natural release of oxytocin, which helps women to cope, is gonna be decreased. So how many times do we give a woman an epidural and see that her contractions peter out? And I know that there's some thought that that's all related to um, the fluid bolus, but really re when we look at the physiology of labor, you really see that that interrupts the oxytocin release. And then one thing I have here in this slide too is that it's important to realize that synthetic oxytocin or pitocin that we give does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So women who are getting induced, a lot of times we'll talk about how their labor was so much worse than their normal labor, and this is why. They don't get that same release of um, hormones that they would with normal labor and pain control hormones. So there's five practices that can help you to facilitate physiologic labor. If you can, if it's medically okay, and, and remember most, this, this um, is mostly about, this talk is mostly about normal risk women. Um, so if we can, letting the labor start on its own um, ensures that the mom and the baby are ready for labor. If you let them move, we know that women who are able to move and be upright in labor have less um, pain or per perception of pain. And it also helps protect the birth canal so that upright position allows the baby to make that rotation and descent that they need to make. Of course, if they're supported in their labor, whether they be with doula or um, their spouse or friends, that does decrease their fear response and promote relaxation. And it also promotes um, privacy, which is really important for that respectful maternity care. Sorry. Um, fourth, if we allow women spontaneous pushing in birth and upright position, um, again, facilitates that rotation and descent. And we're going to talk a little bit about spontaneous pushing um, as we go along in the lecture. And then, of course, um, I know as we're really uh, in the 20 years that I've been doing um, labor and delivery, we really are working harder at making sure that moms and babies are kept together, um, especially with skin to skin and helps the facilitation uh, of the baby from intrauterine life to extrauterine life as well as allows us to delay that cord clamping and helps the mom to be able to initiate the breastfeeding. And here's a, I, I have lots of references kind of sprinkled in throughout the, um, the lecture there for you guys to look if you want to read the uh, entire articles that are there. So why is it important that we recognize what normal labor is and what it isn't? Well, if you recognize what normal labor is, that prevents you from um, doing interventions that can disrupt the normal process. Um, if they're having abnormal labor, then it also promotes actions um, that um, we, so we would intervene when it's necessary, when it's necessary, sorry. But we can also do other actions that help support her in her normal labor. Um, and then we can identify modifiable and non-modifiable non myofitable risk factors that can impede her from having labor and birth. Um, for example, um, continuous fetal monitoring is a good example of that. If the woman has no indication for an, um, continuous fetal monitoring, that's a modifiable risk factor um, that might impede her um, ability to have a normal or physiologic spontaneous birth. Um, so the make, the, how do you diagnose normal labor? Well, women should be admitted in labor when they have regular contractions. Um, that's not necessarily defined. It's defined in lots of different ways and, and a lot of different literature, so I did not give specifics there. But that the regular contractions should require the focus and attention of the woman, meaning they're painful, um, that they should be significantly effaced, and that they should be at least four to five centimeters. Um, with documented cervical change, even if that cervical change, the first exam was in the office a couple days prior. 
Um, and we'll talk about how timing of admission is important to women's outcomes and whether they have interventions or not. So how do we keep labor normal? Um, the World Health Organization um, talks about using the least number of um, least possible number of interventions consistent with safety. And then ACOG also came out really um, last year with a really nice committee opinion about limiting interventions during labor and birth. And so that's actually going to be a lot of the outline that I use for the rest of the talk is talking about each one of these interventions um, and what the literature is behind that and how we can help women to continue through labor without doing these interventions if possible. So the first one is um, avoiding routine amniotomy. Um, so there is a lot of literature about this. There's a nice um, Cochrane database uh, systematic review for amniotomy for short, um, sport, shortening spontaneous labor. And really amniotomy alone, and I'm not talking about induction because induction is, is different, but we're talking about in spontaneous labor, that amniotomy alone did not shorten the length of labor. Um, it didn't improve APGARs. It didn't reduce the risk of core prolapse. So if you're thinking, oh, it's a controlled rupture that didn't uh, improve outcomes with uh, routine amniotomy. And it did not reduce the risk of abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. Um, the WHR, the WHO recommends um, use of amniotomy alone for prevention of a delay of labor is not recommended. So sometimes people think, well, you know, she's four to six centimeters cruising along, uh, but our contractions are every four minutes only, and we really would like them to be two to three, so let's go ahead and rupture her so she doesn't slow down. It's not considered a um, good medical intervention. Um, people also think, well, let's do early amniotomy with oxytocin augmentation um, to prevent delay, and that's also not recommended. We will be talking about induction, though, which is different. <laughs> um, so the next thing that ACOG talks about is using non-pharmacological pain relief methods, which um, are, can be really important in really supporting that women's physiologic process into labor. So none of the non-pharmacological methods have been shown to cause harm. And there's a lot of literature about hydrotherapy, intradermal sterile water injections, nishas, pitocin, um, pitocin, physician changes relaxation. Um, but in some studies, it really has shown to have a decreased pain for um, pain perception for women. Um, and then other things like TENS units, which unfortunately we don't use a lot at Sinai, which I really wish that we would. Um, using a chiropractor, acupuncture, and aromatherapy are also options as well. Sometimes not as, stud as well studied, but um, anecdotally with good results. So hydrotherapy is very well studied. There is a meta-analysis and it does talk about women who are allowed to use the tub when they're in labor. And I'm not talking about water birth. We'll have Emmy give us a lecture on that sometime. Um, but we do see the reduced use of analgesia, the reduction in maternal anxiety and fetal malpresentations, thinking um, posterior or OP positions, uh, increased rates of maternal satisfaction if they're allowed to use the tub. And we see cervical dilation progress equivalent um, to standard labor practices. So women who are in the tub are not gonna slow down even though sometimes there may be a perception that their labor slows down. Their cervical dilation has not been proven to slow down. And there's no benefit or harm as far as neonatal outcomes go. For those of you who are a little bit more concerned about getting your women in the shower or in the bathtub, there has been also stud randomized controlled trials on showering which really show that there is a significant difference in tension, anxiety, their ability to relax and cope um, with showering. Um, and then we also have noticed that women who shower for 30 minutes after they're in active labor actually have an increased rate of cervical dilation, which I thought was really very interesting. We, I think in those studies, they were really hoping to see a, a big difference in pain or fatigue. Um, though it, they were not statistically significant, um, though the, their, their statistic did show a decrease for both. And then women who shower had no abnormal fetal or maternal outcomes. So for those of you who are hesitant to get your patients in the tub, perhaps because she's ruptured, even though being ruptured in the tub is not a contraindication, um, showering is always a good alternative um, that has good outcomes and will help women continue with that physiologic process of labor. 
So sterile water papules, I also specifically wanted to talk about this because I know a lot of you have not seen them or haven't done them. Um, I have done them um, with the assistance of a nurse. It's always easier if there's two providers um, and you each make your injections at the same time um, because it's painful. Um, and so a lot of times what happens is women will get one set of shots and not the second shots. Um, but essentially, sterile water papules consist of four intradermal injections, you can see those um, spots marked on your slide, of sterile water into the skin surrounding the rhombus of Michaelis, Michaelis or the sacral area. And there is actually randomized control trials about sterile water papules as well. Um, and they looked at pain, epidural, APGAR, mode of delivery, timing of delivery, maternal satisfaction, and breastfeeding scores. Um, and they did note that pain scores were significantly lowered by 30 minutes, that maternal satisfaction was significantly higher, um, but that the need for epidurals, the time of delivery or the mode of delivery, APGAR scores and breastfeeding scores were similar in both groups, which is good. This means that this, this intervention, this natural intervention, is not gonna actually impact um, this mother's physiologic labor process. They were consistent with each, you know, each group of women. So um, ACOG goes on to talk about use of intermittent auscultation. And I know that this is uh, something that a lot of people are not con um, comfortable doing, even though the evidence is really very clear. Um, so continuous fetal monitoring has been associated with increased rates of C-section and operative vaginal birth without decreased rates of poor outcome outcomes in low-risk women. So you have to be cautious with who you're using this with. Are you putting your preeclamptics uh, on intermittent auscultation? Of course not, it's not appropriate. And I know at Sinai, um, unfortunately, you as physicians don't always see a lot of low-risk pregnancies. Um, but continuous fetal monitoring for low-risk pregnancies hasn't had any um, good outcomes beyond a decrease in neonatal seizures, which at the age of four, those kids are at the same place as their peers. Um, there's lots of reviews, uh, lots of evidence on this. I won't go through it all with you. It's here if you would like to read it. Um, but essentially, the uh, meta-analysis in the Cochrane reviews did talk that continuous fetal monitoring was associated with increased rates of C-section and operative vaginal delivery, however, did not show the risk of death or C, um, did not decrease the risk of death or CP, which is really, really why people thought um, external monitoring would be helpful. Um, there was also other, uh, and again, I won't read these all to you, but um, there was this really interesting study that was published in birth last year that um, supports the same uh, outcomes that we just talked about, but that they talked about, um, they were wondering in their women who had continuous monitoring, who had more um, C-sections and more operative vaginal deliveries, if that was because of the lack of mobility. Um, we talk about how what's going to disrupt the physiologic process of labor, that release of oxytocin that continues to increase as moms cope with their labor. Um, but they also, and, and mobility and being up around promotes that process of coping and increased oxytocin release. But it was interesting that the um, Authors of this study actually talk about, on the bottom here, the lack of mobility can possibly lead to a cascade of interventions affecting the length of labor and contributing to prolonged labors. Um, so I thought that was a, a insightful um, part of their discussion in that paper. The other reason that people don't wanna use um, intermittent fetal monitoring is they're worried about litigation. And really, um, litigation has been talked about in a lot of different areas when we come to talking about continuous fetal monitoring. One that I thought that was really interesting was in this 1999 Stanford Law Review, and they put out a statement about um, continuous monitoring. And they think instead of protecting obstetricians from litigation or, or healthcare providers, um, it actually makes it, it can actually make it worse because here you have a permanent um, fetal monitoring uh, record that can increase problems because we all know the interpretation of um, the strip is all different. I and mean, we sit at the desk and, and in the conference room and say, no, those are early's or no, those are late's or I would call those variables or I wouldn't cause, call that anything because it's not 15 seconds long. Um, so <clears throat> they actually went ahead to say that that actually might cause you more problems versus if you just had an intermittent tracing. And then of course, because the evidence doesn't support continuous monitoring, um, 
they, their thoughts were that the courts would look at intermon intermittent monitoring as an ex uh, equally as acceptable way of monitoring the baby. So it really is interesting that when you think you're protecting yourself by having continuous monitoring, you actually might be hurting yourself legally. So back to this ACOG committee opinion, the next one is talking about frequent position changes. We've talked a little bit about that as far as um, encouraging the physiologic birth process. Um, but ACOG itself does encourage the adoption of mobility and upright positions in labor. And when we're talking about rupturing to prevent labor and how that that's not an acceptable uh, labor dystocia or the slowing of labor, that's not an acceptable um, intervention. But they do consider uh, position changes in labor pre a preventative, acceptable preventative um, intervention that um, delay against the delays of first stage labor. So I put on there, why do you think it's a preventative action? I kind of said that already, so I won't make you go on that. And it's really kind of awkward with you all muted anyways. So um, again, more literature about position changes in labor. We do that up, upright positions can shorten the duration of labor by uh, over an hour. Um, upright position was also associated with decreased rates of C-section um, and women are less likely to have an epidural. I do have another section here a little bit on position changes. It does talk about um, sitting, like upright sitting position changes and the increased rates of postpartum hemorrhage and laceration. We'll talk about that a little bit more and essentially what that's um, related to. Um, delayed admission from women in latent labor. So this is a hard one sometimes because women come in and they're really uncomfortable. Um, we know the literature supports um, that women who are um, admitted prior to four centimeters have a, a less satisfactory birth experience. They're more likely to get Pitocin and they're more likely to have a C-section birth. So being that we don't want that for our low risk, normal laboring patients, what do we do with those women? Um, so things that you can talk to them about is, um, of course, hydrotherapy. It's kind of those things that we've just been talking about. Um, taking a shower, taking a bath, rest, making sure that they're eating um, so that, and drinking so that their uterus can effectively work as a muscle. Um, supporting our women, giving them education about all of these things. What is active labor? What is latent labor? When do you need to be in the hospital? What are the danger signs? You can talk about um, in, uh, augmentation methods with them that are more natural, such as nipple stimulation, which we'll talk about in induction today. Um, castor oil, the studies are not great on castor oil. There are some that show increased rates of meconium staining in the baby. So I am very hesitant to ever tell people to take castor oil, but you're, you know, you have to be comfortable with what you um, advise. Um, but we all know that sex can sometimes help things along. We can offer them membrane sweeping. Um, if they're in pro, like a latent labor, that's just kind of going on. It's their second, third admission and you're trying to help them out. I know that I have wine there as a question mark. Um, and we, you know, back in the day, uh, this kind of tells how old I am, um, and this actually happened right before I started doing obstetrics, is we used to treat labor, um, preterm labor with um, IV alcohol. So we do know that wine can have an impact on that uterine muscle. Of course, you'd have to be exceedingly careful who you recommend that to. Um, but, you know, it's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And then, of course, you can offer them Visceral, Benadryl, or Ambient to help to see if they can kind of get past this labor latent point to where we can delay their admission until um, active labor. The other option is always to do um, morphine sleep. Um, there is a Friedman's protocol. It's the most common protocol that's out there, though it doesn't seem like we follow that necessarily at Sinai. People are anxious with the higher doses. But Friedman's protocol um, recommends 15 milligrams sub-Q or IM or 20 milligrams for larger women, um, which is really the majority of our women who come into Sinai. Reevaluate them after 20 minutes. And if the contractions have ceased or their respiration is depressed, then of course, no further interventions. But if their contractions are continuing and no change in cervical dilation is noted, you can give another 10 milligrams of IM morphine. Um, so, that's a lot, um, but I think that we do uh, a disservice to women. We are not treating for um, more for sleep versus just giving them some analgesics. Um, the expected range to this to last is 10 to 20 minutes in some women's, especially in lower doses, or two to four hours. 
And what we know that the regimen in some women will provide up to, if you give the higher doses, up to six to 10 hours of sleep. 85% of women treated with this therapy will awaken in active labor. 10% will have cessation of labor. And only 5% will continue on with this effective, uh, ineffective labor. And that may be the time that you decide that an intervention is more appropriate. Excuse me. Um, and again, this is just another study complete in 2014 that talks about, um, uh, sorry, morphine sleep again. Um, and then it talked about uh, so no significant differences in maternal or neonatal morbidity in those admitted versus discharged home after treatment with morphine sleep. So some people are anxious about sending people home after they give them morphine, um, but this really showed that they, um, they can be discharged after we give them morphine. So continue with the ACOG committee opinion for limiting interventions. Um, we talk about expectant management for a period of 12 to 24 hours after um, um, preterm, yes, pre-labor pre um, rupture of membranes, and it should be offered and supported. And so there's a lot of actual good literature about um, expectant management with PROM. And it shows that most women are going to go in up to 80% into spontaneous labor within eight, uh, 12 hours, sorry. Um, but that expected management for 12 to 24 hours is reasonable. Um, it does require careful counseling, though. And there's a lot of studies that talks about, um, you know, we know that how long somebody is ruptured is directly correlated with their risk of infection. Um, and so we have to be cautious when we're counseling them. This is um, expected management is, um, with PROM is also not recommended for people with GBS. Um, let's see. So women who are managed at home had significantly longer um, rupture times, but from time from admission to delivery actually was shorter in the expectedly managed group. And there are no differences in secondary outcomes. Those secondary outcomes meaning APGAR scores, NICU admissions, rates of infections, um, fetal heart rate changes. I think that's it. So when we have women in the midwifery clinic who call and they are ruptured, um, first of all, we talk to everybody about calling immediately. Don't just stay home ruptured without letting us know. Because then you as the provider can take the time to assess if they're appropriate for uh, outpatient or inpatient management. Um, so the first thing I always think of is GBS status, because if they're GBS positive, of course, that immediately makes them not appropriate for outpatient management. Um, so that's kind of an easy one to think of right away. Um, talking to the patient about their comfort level of staying home. Are they comfortable with staying home when their bag is broken? And I, I find it's probably about 50-50. Um, are they preterm? Of course, that makes them not a candidate. Do they have a known malposition? Not a candidate. Do they have a poor support system? Or are they going to have transportation issues getting to the hospital if things happen? Or do they live a long way? You know, sometimes I have patients who drive up from Kenosha and I'm less comfortable with them being home or ruptured, especially when they're starting to contract than I do if somebody lives 10 minutes away from the hospital. Or is the patient somebody who's not ability, doesn't have the ability to really monitor for fever or decreased fetal movement? So maybe a teen, maybe somebody with a learning disability um, or history of being unreliable, not coming to the prenatal visits, might not be the best person to have expectant outpatient manage of PROM. When you do have a patient who's appropriate, of course you need to counsel them, and I, and I kind of touched base on this before. So you need to continue to tell them to monitor for active fetal movement. If they don't have normal movement, they need to come in. They need to monitor for fever, um, anything 100.4 or greater. I always tell them, do not have sex or put anything in your vagina, because it's really amazing how many people will decide that having sex one last time is a good idea. Um, so I specifically tell them do not have sex or put anything in their vagina during this time. Um, of course, if they're feeling anything come out of their vagina, so if they're feeling the cord, a foot, something else, that they should get in hands and knees, head down, butt up, and be calling 911. And then I always like to make a plan with my patients as to, okay, how long are you comfortable staying at home? When do you think that you're gonna be coming back in? Because I do think that that's important that we have kind of an idea. It's important for me as the person that's on service to know, and it's also important for me to pass to the next shift, like so-and-so is out there, she's ruptured, she's doing all these things, and 
And if you don't hear from her by this time, which I usually, we usually in our practice use 24 hours after they've called us to notify them of their birth, of their um, rupture time, then we reach out to them to see what's going on and um, when they're planning on coming in. And then we always let people know that if there's no labor when they present to the hospital, so if you have somebody who's staying home 24 hours, um, that we're gonna recommend starting Pitocin so that they, they don't come in and they, you know, 24 hours later and they're surprised that we're recommending they be induced at that time. We don't tell patients a specific time frame in our practice because we think that opens us up to um, maybe some legal issues, but we do talk about the increased rates of infection um, the longer that they're ruptured. And when we try to come for a plan, um, when they're going to come to the hospital, we, we usually try to make, we usually try to get it to be 24 hours or less. Um, but we, we like to avoid giving a specific time frame to our patients. So um, doula support is the next thing that ACOG re recommends for having um, little interventions or having less interventions in um, spontaneous labor. We know that sometimes doulas can be difficult to work with um, and that they make our job a little bit more challenging because sometimes they're advocating for themselves versus advocating for their patients or, or in, uh, encouraging the patients to advocate for themselves. But we do know that in the end, the outcomes for women who have doulas in labor are significantly improved over women who don't. Shorten labors, increased rates of vaginal deliveries, decreased needs of, um, need for analgesia, fewer operative delivery, higher maternal and family satisfaction rate, which are important when you get these women who are coming in saying that they did not feel listened to. This is a really important part. They're also less likely to have a C-section and less likely to have an infant with low APGAR scores. So the little bit of sometimes pain that it causes us to work with a doula really is supported in the literature as being a good thing for the mom and the baby dyad. Um, physiologic pushing is something that I think that we all try to um, really <laughs> work with with our patient and try to not do a lot of coaching if they don't need it. So physiologic, physiologic pushing um, has a lot of different kind of definitions. Sometimes people just say, you know, do what your body tells you to do. Sometimes people say it's the actual delay of pushing until mom has an urge to push. Um, and then that um, in water birth, it's actually talked about the passive and the active um, second stage, where the passive being, they may be complete, but there's not the urge to push. And the active being that actual type, time of labor when they want to push. Um, so physiologic pushing is defined um, in this um, 2019 article by Ellis et al. as um, delaying the pushing until a woman feels an urge to push. Uh, up until then, she has passive descent and encourage open glottis pushing when the woman has the actual urge to do it. The, this particular study and a lot of studies that I've read, it does talk about women who physiologically push experiencing less pain, less fatigue, and a more positive experience overall versus Valsalva or directly pushing. Um, there's no real clear differences between the rates of operative vaginal delivery, C-sections, episiotomy, or lacerations in, in some studies. In some studies, they do talk about less uh, lacerations. Um, but they know, what we know about is Valsalva pushing, they definitely have a shorter second stage. Um, so when we're standing there in our N95 and we're hot and miserable, it's really tempting to try to encourage people to Valsalva push. Um, but we don't know, we do know that there are some effects of Valsalva pushing. Um, especially at three months out, we know that women who were taught or instructed to Valsalva push have uh, increased rates of abnormal urodynamics at three months postpartum which I know when I'm in the office at three months postpartum and seeing women or even six weeks postpartum um, who are peeing themselves all the time, that's, that's really a quality of life issue. So, um, so Valsalva pushing can increase those risks. Um, and then there's also a nice study, and there's a couple studies about this, about um, where they did continuous fetal oxygen saturation monitoring in the second stage, and they compared Valsalva pushing to physiologic pushing. And they really saw, everybody had fetal desaturation. Everybody had that in the second stage. Um, but what was significant is that the active pushing groups um, had longer periods of um, deoxygenation because they're pushing that whole time of second stage. 
versus women who did um, physiologic pushing got really that fetal um, oxygen desaturation only at the end when they were in that active part of the second stage. So I thought that was um, pretty interesting. And they use these little monitors they put up and put on their heads or their cheeks to get their continuous oxygen. It was very interesting. Um, so physiologic pushing, we know the length of the second stage was shorter in the immediate pushing or the Valsalva group, but the length of active pushing was significantly longer. So we see fatigue differences in moms. Their overall labor length, no difference. Um, and the immediate pushing or the Valsalva pushing group in this study did show a significant degree um, a change in, per, um, sorry, a significant amount of um, perineal lacerations um, in the immediate pushing group compared to the delayed group. And again, no differences in secondary outcomes. Can you just tell, sorry, can I ask a question? Of course. Can you, how big was the study? Like, where was it done? I just... Um, go back to like your last presentation, then this, I'm not remembering this as well as other things. Right, um, you know, because I changed quite a bit in this lecture, uh, I can find it for you. This is the, the study that's on the screen now is the one I have these two. Are you talking about the oxygen one? Well, I guess, I guess both of them. I'm just, I'm okay. curious about this. Yeah, especially the oxygenation, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, and I really wish I could tell you, Molly, off the top of my head, but I've read so much literature in the last few days that I can't remember. I think these were both smaller studies, 100-ish women or so. Um, but the, um, you know, on each one of these, I have them, I have the, oops, sorry. Um, the references here for you. So I can either look at it for you or you can review the article yourself. So what, so this physiologic pushing is mm -hmm. essentially in that last couple of slides, it's basically like what the mom wants to do? Correct. So when we're talking about normal labor, we're not talking about people with, uh, uh, epidurals necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. So epidurals is gonna, maybe maybe those moms need more directed pushing. Okay. Okay, but in women who you've seen have no epidural, they pretty much know how to push, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, that makes sense. I was gonna say, because I was like, I just feel like there's so many people who don't effectively push unless we tell them how to push. Right, so I know in my practice um, personally that I always try to let everybody physiologically push to start. Mm -hmm. and see how they do uh, and it and it seems like my moms who are unmedicated or who've just had a little IV medications that they really get to that physiologic pushing where they're having effective physiologic pushing probably within 15 minutes mm -hmm. to where they're getting really the hang of how they need to push it's really my moms who are um, medicated with or especially with an epidural that I really find that they are the ones that need that directed pushing where you have to sometimes put your fingers in the vagina and tell them to push right here because they can't feel that or encourage them to push for longer periods of time um, because they're not feeling when their contraction is. Right. Um, so I think that's completely appropriate. On this physiologic pushing, do you know what their women with epidurals or was it all? Um, I think that there were some women with epidurals, especially in the, um, the study about the oxygenation. The other one, I don't remember. Okay, I'll take a look at it, but okay, thank you. Thank Sorry, you. I mean, I had a whole bunch more stuff on here about the actual studies, um, but I only have 80 minutes to do two subjects. <laughs> so I cut out a lot of stuff. No, all good, thank you. All right, thank you for your question. Um, okay, I think we did that. Okay, um, and then I also just um, talking about um, position changes and position changes in the second stage as far as pushing goes. Um, and this is where we talk a little bit about the, the uh, upright positions and the pros and cons of them. So we know that overall frequent position changes um, promote maternal comfort and fetal positioning, right? Even with our epidural ladies, we're flipping them back and forth every, you know, 30 minutes to an hour because that helps promote um, those cardinal rotations that the cardinal movements that the baby needs to do. Um, but when they looked at um, positioning, upright and lateral positions were associated with less fetal heart rate abnormalities, lower rates of episiotomies, and a decrease in operative vaginal births. Um, and then the upright positions, and this is a lot of time talking about upright when they're on a birth chair or on a birth stool, um, they were associated with an increase in second degree lacerations and an increase in postpartum hemorrhage. So when I went back when we had a birth stool um, and I had women who were on the birth stool, I would actually have them as we were getting close to that crowning stage, if they could either stand or even get into the bed in like maybe a sideline position, 
because we know these rates of lacerations and hemorrhage are higher in women, especially who are using birth stools. But sometimes that's the only way you can get them to push. So it's, it's kind of a pro and con there. And then when we look at squatting or kneeling, um, if we look at this photo right here, can you guys see my cursor or not? I can but, see it. Okay. So all this time I've been playing with it, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so if we have this dark line as the upright um, line um, when they're not squatting, but then you can see that we have this squatting here that moves that sacrum out of the way. And I don't know about a lot of you, but I have had many times where I have a patient who wants to push on her back, so I'm not gonna tell her what she has to do, but who I, I know, especially in a multip, whose baby should be coming down and around that corner, and they're not, and then I roll them to their side, and we get, um, and bring the top leg up, and we get this movement of the sacroiliac joint, and their babies come right down. Um, and then of course, for the squatting and kneeling too, we can see what happens to this outlet. This outlet really widens when they have that squatting um, or a kneeling position. So just something to think about um, as you're having women push these diameters that, um, and make position change in labors, that these can really make a big difference when you're having that baby that just won't get under that bone. Um, and then I didn't put the ACOG, um, outline back up here, but ACOG also talks about doing family-centered cesareans, which I'm not going to talk a lot about um, because it's really not part of that normal birth anymore. But um, we do see in a lot of studies greater familial satisfaction with the birth process, increased rates of skin-to-skin, -skin, which leads to higher breastfeeding rates, and then we also have increased rates of delayed cord clamping. So while maybe their labor didn't go normal and they needed to have a cesarean for whatever reason, it's, we can still work to have respectful maternity care for women. Um, I know that Forgy's um, study didn't necessarily show that there was a statistically increased amount of patient satisfaction, but they did see an overall increase even though it wasn't statistically significant. So the kind of big principles to think about with normal birth, Risk, is, risk assessment is continual. So if you have somebody who starts out normal and then they, of course they get abnormal, then that calls for interventions as appropriate. Um, but if their birth continues normal, their labor continues to be normal, then intervention would not be appropriate. Um, and then non-interference is key. So there should be a really good reason that you're doing an intervention with a patient. To speed up their labor is not necessarily an okay thing um, to do just for that intervention as long as there's not need for immediate delivery. I'm not talking about somebody who's got preeclampsia and needs to have, be managed. I'm talking about normal physiologic labor. The one thing that ACOG didn't talk about that I'm gonna kind of talk about um, is oral and IV hydration. Um, ACOG still recommends clear liquids in labor. Um, and really, have, nobody else does. <laughs> If you look at kind of the rest of the world and what the literature says, nobody talks about um, clear, just only having clear liquids in labor. ACOG does um, talk about doing things like honey sticks or candies, juice or water. There's some studies that are good with um, like D5LR, especially in Nelliparis women, um, that they have shorter first stages of labor if we give them some IV solution. So that kind of, um, stuff is changing. And there, the ACOG practice bulletin is from 20, mm, 2009. And so I think some of this stuff is gonna be changing, um, but this is something that I think that we need to take into consideration as we're trying to do evidence-based practice. And when we take something like the ARRIVE trial, which comes out and we like immediately adopt it, and we modify it for our, our use, right? Because the ARRIVE trial was done on Nella Paris women, but we immediately say like, okay, let's do uh, elective inductions on multips, which really that study wasn't about. If we really are working at doing um, evidence-based medicine, the evidence really says that women would benefit from not fasting and from having a light meal. Um, and even the research by the American Society of Anesthesiologists, who seem to be part of the, the people who are really against women having um, nutrition during labor, their research shows that really that risk of aspiration is almost non-existent and that women really can benefit from um, having meals. And I'm not gonna read their statement to you, you can go ahead and read it, but essentially their research shows the same thing, but we've not had any progress in that um, way as far as having food and fluids, especially for low risk normal women. <laughs> 
So something to think about as you're coming to be providers on your own, really looking at what the evidence says versus what's been the typical practice and moving in that um, direction. And then there's lots of studies on it. Um, in a school. What's that? Can you, can you use Pitocin if you add sugar to their LR? Uh, that's a really good question. And I don't Cause know. I know. Okay, because I know you can't use normal saline because oxytocin isn't compatible. So I just didn't know if we think about adopting it if our normal intervention is not compatible. Yeah, I don't know if that you would need a secondary line or not. That's something that I could look up. Um, it was, there's just, if, you, if you've been on it all looking at IV hydration, there's been a lot of new literature coming out, which me as a midwife, I don't necessarily like, um, <laughs> because I don't want people to have IVs unless they need them. Um, but what does talk, what is talking about um, uh, isotonic dextrose solutions being beneficial for women in labor. My thought as a midwife is if we let them have caloric intake, um, via their mouth, if they can tolerate that, that that's a good way also to get glucose in your system. Um, but I wish I, I wish I could answer your question fully. But it'd be easy enough to look up. So let's move on. That was the normal labor stuff. This is now where we're going into the induction of labor stuff. So induction of labor, um, this is kind of the outline that I'm gonna follow for this lecture. We're gonna go through the definition of um, the, oh, uh, first of all, anybody have any other questions about the normal labor stuff? No? Okay. Um, you know, I'm always happy to ask questions or answer questions, so you can always shoot them to me too and I can let you know from the studies that I found what, I, what I'm talking about. Um, so induction of labor. So we're going to use the ACOG definition of induction of labor. We're going to talk about criteria for induction, indicated versus elective, the two phases of induction, talking about cervical ripening and then following with oxytocin. And we're going to talk about each one of those methods um, that you can use for ripening and in, in induction. We're going to talk a, very briefly on uh, outpatient induction and um, then the diagnosis of failed induction. And I know this is a lot of information for one lecture, but Pause me, pause or let me know if you have any questions. So ACOG um, in their Revitalize um, project, which is just an obstetric database of definitions so that they're all um, the same, um, talks about induction as using a pharmacological or a mechanical method to initiate labor. Um, and then examples of those, rupture, balloons, oxytocin, prostaglandins, laminaria, um, and induction, it's still considered an induction if they've had a previous attempt at inducting induction. So if they've been sent home after their Foley ball because they didn't labor and they come back in, it's still another induction, obviously. And then um, more, more um, specifically, if you have somebody who now their ACOG says spontaneous rupture of membranes without contractions, we all would call that PROM. Um, so if somebody comes in and they have prom but not labor, it's still con considered an induction and not an, an augmentation. So always there's criteria for inductions of labor, right? We always want to know their gestational age, uh, identify any potential risks to the mother or the fetus of induction. Uh, are they preterm, example? Or do they have GBS? Um, and then of course we always need to talk about uh, criteria for counseling. So we need to talk to them about why we're inducing them, what agents we're, we're considering using, the possible need for a repeat induction if it doesn't work, especially if it's not an indicated induction, or a cesarean delivery. Um, and then there's the difference between elective inductions or, or not even non-elective inductions and spontaneous labor. So let them know that the time interval is probably gonna be longer than it would with spontaneous labor, that there's probably gonna be more interventions, that their birth preferences might not be something that we can um, or their birth plan, we like to call them preferences, um, might not be something we can stick to with an induction. Um, and then that her perception of her birth may be different, which women have plans in their minds of how their birth is gonna go right from the beginning. So talking about to them about how those things, what, how their expectations are and that they, or what the expectations are and how things may be different than what they initially expected. Um, and then of course, obviously, What's their cervix doing? What position is the baby in? And is the baby doing fine and will tolerate an induction? Of course, there's always contraindications to induction and they're essentially the same that are contraindications to a vaginal delivery. So vasoprevia, complete previa, malposition or transverse lie, 
uh, an umbilical cord prolapse. I thought that was funny that that was in the, <laughs> the literature, but here there it is. Um, a previous classical cesarean delivery, active HSV infection, so outbreak or prodromal symptoms, and uh, a previous myomectomy entering the endometrial cavity or previous uterine surgery that um, affects the endometrial cavity. So uh, examples of indicated labor inc include in um, inductions for hypertensive disorders, POM or PROM or PREPROM, post-term pregnancy, choreo, maternal medical conditions, so diabetes, renal disease, chronic pulmonary disease, antiphospholipid syndrome, anything that can cause fetal compromise, so growth restriction, oligohydramnios, anhydramnios. Um, a lot of what we're seeing coming out of triage now is, you know, category two um, tracing at term is a good reason, or even, um, of course, fetal, um, decreased fetal movement. The other reason that might be for an indicated induction would be logistical concerns. So do you have a multip who's had a history of fast labors and an undesired home birth? Um, do they have to uh, travel a long ways from, to the hospital or other psychosocial indications? So we've induced women whose husbands are deploying um, because they're gonna be, only be home for another week. So we've done those type of things as well. And ACOG considers those logistical concerns an indicated induction. Um, there's two other things that I want to talk about maybe as indicated induction, which are not currently, but uh, when you read the literature, I question if we're not heading that direction. Um, and well, the first one is just macrosomia. And I'm not saying these are indicated, but I'm saying that maybe we're going in that direction based on the literature. Um, so macrosomia, so there's new research mostly out of Europe that shows a promise for the reduction in shoulder social rates um, in kids who have suspected macrosomia. So it's still not, in, like I said, it's still not considered an indication. Um, but that at 39 weeks, ACOG broadly supports elective induction. So that's kind of maybe a soft call that you could use to help decide if maybe that's an elective induction. The research on um, macrosomia is improving, but still not enough to say that we're going to make those changes. Um, the other thing that I really think we're going to go towards is um, for an uh, indicated induction is class three maternal obesity. I went to a high risk conference about I don't know, a year ago, and there was a maternal fetal medicine specialist that was talking about obesity and pregnancy and how he has actually started inducing every woman with a BMI of 40 or over, even if they don't have other comorbidities. So really, when we look at the literature, we see obese women we know have increased rates of stillbirths. They have increased rates of development of hypertensive disorders, and they have increased rates of brachial plexus injuries. Um, so the studies looked at induction of labor and obesity, they looked anywhere between 37 and 39 weeks. And those inductions between 37 and 39 weeks do show significant benefit to obese women over expected management. Um, they've had lower C-section rates, lower stillbirth rates, and lower rates of macrosomia. So I, I think that maybe we were headed that way. I think, you know, with us doing antenatal testing, twice a week on our obese women, especially our obese women with BMIs or 40, I think that's kind of the logical next step. But that's my opinion. Um, so of course, to every um, induction, there's pros and cons, um, and especially with elective inductions. Um, the pros are, of course, they're convenient because um, we can schedule them. They have uh, less risk of cesarean section and less at-risk time, so time to have a stillbirth or time to develop hypertensive disorders. Induction's are, though, more costly so the because you're paying for longer times of staffing and longer patient time uh, it does increase intervention uh, with the process of labor and for some women and especially like a lot of my women um, it doesn't align with their personal preferences so you can counsel them about elective induction and decrease rates of c-section all day but it doesn't necessarily go with what their preferences are for labor so elective induction um, is considered induction at 37 weeks um, or longer and uh, at Sinai, we use 39 weeks, and I think most places recognize 39 weeks as being an appropriate time for elective induction. Um, but when they looked at, in a Cochrane review, when they looked at induction at or beyond 37 weeks versus waiting for a spontaneous labor or 41 completed weeks, we definitely had decreased rates of perinatal death, lower C-section rates, fewer NICU admissions. And, um, but the thing to keep in mind is that the number of women that we had to induce um, so the number needed to treat to prevent one um, death was 544. 
So you're gonna be doing a lot of inductions to prevent one perinatal death. And then of course I can't talk about the ARRIVE trial without talking, or talk about elective induction without talking about the ARRIVE trial. Um, I think most of you know what the ARRIVE trial um, is. Um, it was good at really giving us some information between elective induction at 39 weeks. Um, and, but the, it was restricted to low risk Nelloparis women. So I think the generalizability of the ARRIVE trial is a little bit limited. People who were, who, um, were ineligible were twins, multiparous women, oligo, hydramnios, IUGR affected babies, hypersensitive disorders, or diabetes. What they did find and what was significant about the study is that there was a significantly lower risk of C-section in women who were nelliparous who were electively induction induced at 39 weeks and no significant difference, uh, composite difference in neonatal complications. So APGAR stars, NICU admissions, um, neonatal death. Secondary outcomes that they looked at for the ARRIVE trial um, is that they did notice that hypertensive disorders were 30%, 36% lower in the induction group, which is um, significant. Um, and the duration in labor and delivery was longer, but the postpartum stay was slightly shorter. So out from the RAF trial came these, <clears throat> I think are pretty specific recommendations. The authors note that elective induction of labor at 39 weeks should reassure women that it's a reasonable choice and that's unlikely to result in poor outcomes. So they didn't say every woman should be offered an elective induction, but just that if they wanted an elective induction, that was that their, their outcomes were probably not gonna be different. Uh, SMFM came out and said, oh, from this it's reasonable to offer induction of labor to low risk Nelliparis women at or beyond 39 weeks zero days of gestation. So, and then they went on to say that both elective induction and expected management are reasonable options. And then of course, ACNM, which is my governing body, um, warned against the implementation of practice changes to offer 39 week induction of labor, um, to offer that cautiously. Um, and the reason is, is because there are some criticisms of the ARRIVE trial. So, first of all, women had to agree to participate. So, and only 27% of eligible women agree to participate. So that's significant in the sense that you have women who will not, um, their perceptions of how they want their birth to go don't agree or coincide with being electively induced. The overall C-section rate in both groups was lower than in the general United States. So was there something that, is it comparable if the overall C-section rate is lower? Um, so average in the, at that time was 26%, but only 20% um, had a C-section in this um, cohort. Um, the participants are also more likely to be African-American. Um, and we know that in healthcare, African-American um, women and, and people in particular have, um, do not respond the same as necessarily uh, their white or colleague or white other patients or other uh, ethnicities. Um, and then participants were also younger. So is it necessarily generalizable to all populations of Nelliparis women? And then the interesting thing, they talked about hypertension that was decreased by 36% if they induced at 39 weeks. But what they really found when they looked at it is that in a pretty decent sized um, group of women, 8% of the induction group between 38 weeks when they were randomized and 39 weeks when the uh, induction started developed hypertensive or hypertensive disorders. So it's difficult to know if 39 is that good time to induce women for hypertensive disorders or if it should be at 38 weeks, which is, um, or earlier. There are some studies that talk about induction at 37 weeks. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, for prevention, sorry. Uh, it's an interesting kind of criticism. So I think that when we are thinking of the ARRIVE trial, I think it's a great trial. I think it overall was really, really well done. Um, but I think that we need to be cautious in how we generalize it to the general population. So when we're looking at doing any kind of induction, we need to look at the Bishop score. Um, the Bishop score was developed by the modest Dr. Bishop in 1964. Um, and it is a scoring system which takes into account different components of the cervical exam to help us know the woman's readiness or her success rate for induction of labor. Um, it looks at cervical dilation, position of the um, cervix, effacement, station, mm, boy, and something else that I didn't put on there. I'm sorry, I have a uh, slide of it coming up. 
So scores of eight or greater are considered favorable um, and having their chance of vaginal delivery be met is if they had spontaneous labor. Um, some of the literature does recommend using a Bishop score of 10 in Nella Paris women um, as being the rate at which they are having a, um, a similar risk of vaginal delivery versus C-section um, delivery. And a score of six or less definitely indicates further ripening needs. And so here's the Bishop score, which I think at this point probably even the new interns are familiar with. So when we look at different methods for induction, um, I did go off the ACOB practice bulletin number 107. It lays out all of the different complementary uh, methods, the use of prostaglandins, the use of me uh, mechanical methods, and then they also talk about amniotomy and oxytocin. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each one of those. Callie, how much time do I have? You're still good. I think it's scheduled until 1040. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so I just know it took me a little bit of time to get going. So the first thing um, that ACOP talks about is membrane sweeping. And here's a nice picture of membrane sweeping. It's the process of putting the fingers into the vagina through the cervix and making a gentle sweeping motion between the amnia or the, the water bag and the um, lining of the uterus. And if you can see here to the right, you can kind of get this little pocket here is kind of to get the goal. And that of course disrupts the, um, uh, the decidua uh, amnion interface, which uh, increases the hormonal activity of phospholipase A2 and prostaglandin F for you micro nerds. Um, and it increases the likelihood of spontaneous labor within 48 hours and has decreased the need for induction of labor with other methods. So it is known to be effective. It has been associated with PROM in some studies, not all studies, but some. So that's something that you can um, talk about when you're doing your counseling. Um, there are risks to doing it. Of course, it's uncomfortable. Um, people are very commonly have some vaginal bleeding and have some irregular contractions within the next 24 hours, um, which can sometimes just be more annoying to them than just continuing to be pregnant. And there's really not any good data on if you should sweep membranes with women with GBS um, or not. Nipple stimulation is the next method, next map, uh, sorry, natural method in which we um, can induce women. It's appropriate only for low risk pregnancies. There are, have been trials that talk about nipple stimulation and it showed a de significant decrease of women in labor, um, decrease of number of women not in labor within 72 hours um, with favorable services. There's been no studies that have showed tachycystole with or without fetal heart rate changes, which I know we worry about sometimes, but there's nothing of that has shown up in studies. No differences in meconium staining or C-section rates. And in some studies, it shows that women who use nipple stimulation had decreased rates of postpartum hemorrhage. Now, I know a lot of you don't use nipple stimulation, so I decided to just include some instructions here for you. So if you have somebody who's really interested in this, you can tell them how to do it correctly. Um, so essentially rolling the fingers from the outer edge to the nipple, only doing one breast at a time is important. Um, when we're talking about kind of to ripen the cervix for labor, we talk about massage for no more than 15 minutes at a time, stopping if you get any contractions. And then once the contraction resolves, you can restart. Um, you can then um, take a break for two to four minutes after that 15 minutes is done, and then repeat on the other breast. And then you can repeat this process for up to one hour um, three times per day. And that is in the goal of kind of doing some ripening and um, labor preparation. When you're looking at um, using nipple stimulation as a method of maybe keeping contractions going, um, once the contractions begin, you can use stimulation five minutes per breast to increase contractions. You should continue to advise people to stop during contractions. Um, continue to alternate the breast, and if the um, contractions become three minutes apart or less, then they should stop nipple, st nipple stimulation altogether. Acupuncture and acupressure is another kind of complementary method that women can use um, in, a, in addition to their um, medical uh, interventions. Can I ask a question about the nipple stimulation? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you might have said this, and I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, when do you tell them it's okay to start? Like what gestational age? Do you say 37, 38, 39? And then, um, oh, sorry. Okay, go I ahead. A question after that. And then, um, do you, I would assume you don't recommend they ever use a breast pump. Um, I don't, I, I personally do not recommend that they use a breast pump. Um, I think that it's, um, too much though. That's not in the literature. Sometimes that makes it easier, but the, um, 
the stimulation is different if you use your fingers mm -hmm. than if you use a breast pump. So if you really, I think my doorbell might ring you guys, I'm sorry. Um, if you use it, when the people look at the true nature of nipple stimulation, they do talk about manual manipulation versus using a breast pump. Um, what was the other question? What gestational age? 37, 38, 39? <laughs> um, I think that that it would be provider preference. Okay. Um, I know that there's literature when I know like in a green journal, like five, six years ago, they talked about membrane keeping starting at 37 weeks. I think that's a little bit early. Um, because we know that this is a method of induction and can put into women into labor. So I definitely would not recommend this probably prior to 30 to 39 weeks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And then in the studies that talked about doing it for like up to five days and within three days, most women have um, uh, ripe cervixes. Um, <clears throat> just to go back, there is some literature about GBS and membrane sweeping. There's okay. been a couple of good studies. One of them is the strip G study, appropriately named. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't find any evidence of increased risk for GBS infection okay. in those infants with membrane sweeping. Awesome, thank you, Callie. Mm -hmm. You can only look up so much with a new lecture. For real. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get better at this as I give it more. <laughs> All right, um, so acupuncture and acupressure. Not great um, research on this, but also, uh, and there has been a, a fair amount of studies. In the end, acupuncture has been linked to imp, um, improved cervical readiness for labor, so increased cervical ripeness. Um, but as far as actually being uh, good for inducing labor, that's really not been uh, borne out in the literature. All right, so next we should talk about prostaglandins. Um, there's the first prostaglandins are the PGE2s that I'll talk about. Um, we're talking about Cervidil and Prepidil. Prepidil, for those who don't know, is like that PG gel that we talk about. Prepidil is just the name brand that um, is used. Um, so I don't know if any of you have used it. I'm old, so I, of course, have used it. But you get this syringe of um, like this opaque kind of gel. And then you take it and you paint it on the cervix. Um, and you repeat that every four hours like you would with Cytotec. The issue with gel, and it's really well studied, but the issue is, is that it's exceedingly expensive, especially when we compare it to our PGE ones. Um, and then Cervidol is that vaginal insert, which I'm, I think more of you have been, are familiar with. Um, and it contains 10 milligrams of dinoprostone versus two, uh, or 0.5 like the gel. It's inserted into the posterior fornix and removed after 12 hours, but it's, at, it's like a controlled um, release rate. So it's a significantly um, higher dose, but the rate is the same as the gel. Um, so when we look at um, research looking at PGE2s, we know that compared to placebo, of course, there's an increased likelihood of, of delivery within 24 hours. In some studies that showed a possible reduction rate of C-section, um, and, and, but of course, with any kind of intervention and these kind of med, uh, medications specifically, there's an increased rate for tachycystole and associated fetal heart rate changes. Um, I'll just tell you that there are tons and tons of studies comparing PGE1s to PGE2s to Foley bulbs. Um, there's no way we can go through all of that in this lecture, so I apologize for not doing the comparison. Um, the next one is mesoprostol or cytotec, as um, we're familiar with it. It's a PGE1 analog. You can give it vaginally, orally, or sublingually, or buccally. Um, we, of course, should not give it with anybody who's had a previous C-section or any major uterine surgery in the third trimester. Um, complications as uterine um, tachycystole, with and without fetal heart rate changes, um, tends to be dose-dependent. So we know when we use lower dose um, cytotec that we have less of those changes than if we use higher dose cytotec. This is the administration routes that you can do. Um, so you can do vaginal, buccal, or uh, a lot of the literature talks about this oral slurry of mesoprostol being uh, significantly more effective than the other um, types of, or ways to dose mesoprostol. Um, you can give up to six doses. You can initiate Pitocin or oxytocin four hours after the final dose. Of course, because we're worried about hyperstimulation with mesoprostol, we don't want to administer any more doses if they have more than three contractions in 10 minutes. Um, and again, the majority of the adverse outcomes that we've seen in the literature result from doses greater than 25 mics. What do you usually use, Nicole, 
what so what i what i use what i like to do and i might change after reading all these literature in the last couple of weeks um but what i what i've always done is i use i like vaginal but really the, the literature show and i take it out of that little capsule because i have found way too many um mesos in the vagina without like not dissolved <laughs> So I would take the capsule off and put that little thing between my fingers and slide it back. That's been my favorite way to use meso. Um, the research really shows that oral meso, especially if you make like a slurry, is um, much better than vaginal. Um, I, I primarily use oral now and mm -hmm. I have 50. And yeah. I have good outcomes with that. What do you, seniors, what are you gonna, what's your plans? What are you gonna do? Well, I'm going to see if we can do the slurry. Yeah. Because it really okay. shows this 25 months Q4 <laughs> oral slurry really, sh the literature really is supportive of that being the most efficacious with the least amount of side effects. I think buckle and sublingual have the fastest onset of action. I think I'll Thank probably you. do those. So I think with buckle and lingual, um, you can see that it's every two to four hours. And that's different than the vaginal dose because it is absorbed differently. Um, so you can really give like 25 mics. I mean, and there's some studies that talk about titration and giving higher doses at really short intervals to really get people going in labor, especially if you're, I think they did that more for countries that don't have the ability to administer oxytocin safely. Um, it, but it's, the research is really interesting. And I'm gonna, I've learned a couple of things with doing this, learning, writing this lecture, and um, which I wanna change in another one I'll, we'll talk about in a little bit too. I think it's important to remember that um, it's a faster onset for ripening, but also for hemorrhage. So if you are really concerned it's, and people can handle it, it's better to give it orally. Yeah, it's just, it's pretty bitter. So when you're giving the higher doses orally, sometimes it's just not tolerated as well. That might be why that slurry is such a nice thing, because it's kind of hard to let that tablet sit. You have to kind of chew it up and let it sit there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do the slurry. Right, and you can just drink it down. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, the research I was looking at for the buckler, the sublingual, I mean, they're like, if it's still there at 30 minutes, have the patient chew it up then and swallow it. And like 30 minutes of letting that bitter sit in your mouth, that doesn't work for me. All right. Um, all right, so on to the mechanical methods of induction. Um, mechanical methods are the Foley balloon or the double balloon. We know them as cook sets on I. Uh, extra amniotic saline infusion, which is what I'm super excited about trialing right now and getting through the um, Sinai door. Um, and then, of course, there's laminaria. So Foley bulb, I think most of us are familiar with. They are specialized Foley's that have up to 80, um, can inflate up to 80 mils. The catheter is placed through the cervix and then filled with a saline to promote the stretching of the cervix. Um, and you can either do that digitally or by speculum. Um, then that traditional Foley with just the one bulb on it, traction is placed on the catheter, um, but if it's not with the double balloons. And you can kind of see down here below on this slide that I had the picture of the double balloon. Um, but they can stay in place up to 12 to 24 hours, but a lot of the research really doesn't show benefit after 12 hours. Um, and then the cervix is usually three to five centimeters um, dilated upon expulsion. Um, I don't know what your experience is with the Cook's catheters. Mine has not been a great experience. I'm um, typically doing a lot of traditional Foley. Um, I know that a lot of people, though, um, have experience with the Cook's and really like the Cook's. So I like the Cook. Yeah. See, I, I think I might be the only person at Sinai that likes it. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I like, like them. I like the stylet. The stylet's so soft. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like that it provides compression from the top and from the bottom. Absolutely. And I see the rationale behind them. I just have not had good luck with them. And I think they suck to put in, but that's a personal opinion. I also feel like I can get a Foley in and then it's like a normal Foley and it comes out within five to six hours and these cooks have to stay in for a longer time most of the time. So I like the regular ones better too. Yeah, that's been my yeah. to that as well. I think part of the thing with the cook catheter too is because you don't have it on traction, you might not notice that it's out. Do you still have the nurse's pull, Callie? Yeah, I still have the nurse's pull on it, but the part of the problem is when they pull, you get a lot more resistance at that with that vaginal balloon. Mm, yeah, I bet. I think, I think you know if it if it happens after it, right? It's uncomfortable. So if it if it 
continues to go on for longer than what I anticipate, I'll usually deflate, deflate that internal balloon and just check and see. Oh, uh, okay. And a lot of times they're out. Okay, interesting. And it, you can always deflate the internal balloon too and put it on traction. Right, the vaginal balloon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which I still, I still, um, I was really in love with the idea of there being a stylet place, but it's so soft that I find like with my women who are only, who are closed or who are half a centimeter, I have a harder time getting those placed with that stylet. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is really what I'm excited about. Uh, we don't do this at Sinai, and I have not ever worked in a facility. I've worked in a couple different facilities in the last 20 years, um, but where they do this extra amniotic saline infusion. Um, and essentially, you put a Foley in like you would um, for a Foley catheter induction, and then you just fill the balloon to 30 to 40 cc's. There's different protocols that I found. Um, and then what happens is then you um, infuse saline into the uterus at like 40 to 60 mils an hour, and you just keep doing that until the catheter is expelled. And that kind of, it's kind of like, uh, to me, what I imagined was uh, membrane sweeping on steroids because that saline kind of surrounds the entire uterus. And so you get that disruption of the decidua all, all over the uterus. And so what we found really with that disruption uh, and with that kind of constant flow of saline is that the time of ripening was significantly shorter than a traditional Foley or some of um, our the prostaglandins. So I would really, and here's a couple articles if you're interested in, in looking at it. Um, this most latest one is from 2020 um, by Tabasi, and I have a, um, people worry about uh, are their outcomes worse? And they, that study particularly looked at meso, laminaria, um, and the saline infusion. And you can see that um, laminar or the saline infusion was statistically significant um, of, a, of um, complication and that they're reduced with um, these complications besides dilation arrest and choreo. So it's interesting that they have decreased rates of abruption, fetal distress, those types of things. Um, and then when I, the literature also talks about, I was worried about what's their endometritis, their postpartum endometritis rates, and they're not increased over other, um, other ripening methods. I did talk with Dr. Hernandez about it because I was not familiar with it and she did it a lot in her residency. And when she came to Sinai, she did try to get it um, implemented um, because she has had the good experiences with it as well, but ran into a lot of roadblocks. So now that we've had a lot of change, it might be something that I take on as a project to get us to start doing and see how it works. Sorry, Nicole, isn't this causing a small abruption? Like that's the point of it, is to separate the membranes from the uterus. But it's not separating the placenta. And if, you look like right, if you look here, the rates of abruption compared to meso and laminaria were less with a p-value that was way under one. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yeah, I'll have to think about that some more. Yeah, yeah. I thought about this a lot when I was reading these articles. So, um, so let me know what you find. It would be great. I guess it, it kind of makes sense because you would think that they would need a significant amount of pressure to disrupt that placenta uterine interface mm -hmm. versus the membrane. So the membrane isn't necessarily attached so much to the uterus. Right. So when it's you're just distilling that water, it's just slowly separating the membrane. Kind of similar to when you're put, putting in like an IUPC. Yeah. Correct. Not, yeah. not shearing off the placenta. Exactly. And it, right, I mean, the placenta invades the endometrium versus the um, membrane, which just kind of is stuck together with some, I always tell patients, is stuck together with hormonal glue. I know that's not exactly the right physiology, but we can, people can kind of picture what that is going to be like. And so that water, that saline going up there, and it can surround the entire uterus, is kind of just slowly separating that uh, out and letting that prostaglandin release happen. So the, the research I thought was really uh, impressive. So if anybody wants to do a study, <laughs> I'm there. Um, okay, so I, then uh, another of the mechanical is the laminaria. 
Um, it's known as a hygroscopic, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, sorry, dilator. Essentially, they absorb moisture and then expand um, in the cervix, which causes dilation. This also causes um, the disruption between the membranes and the decidua and can lead to that prostaglandin release, um, which can, all, and it can also release to, um, it can also cause changes in the cervical structure. Um, and it's considered safe as effective as other dilators, though in the United States, they're more commonly used for termination. And here's a picture of laminaria. You see the before and then the after. You can see how it's absorbed the water. And again, here on the other side, as you first place it and then um, afterwards. Um, essentially, the procedure is here. You clean the vagina and cervix like you would for putting an IUD. You take these, um, these laminaria sticks and you can sl slowly insert them into the cervix, as many as you can possibly get into the cervix. And you can use a little bit of lubricant to make sure that they slide a little easier. And then you take a four by four and you kind of tuck in all the um, spaces or fornices as they call it in the literature. Um, and then just document your number of dilators and your number of sponges that you have kind of tucked in. And then typically those are removed in 12 to 24 hours. And then that's when we have that cervical ripening. Um, there was a, uh, there's a Cochrane database of systematic review completed on laminaria, and they um, looked at um, mechanical methods versus placebo, prostaglandins, and oxytocin. And the rate of um, tachycystole and adverse fetal heart, chain, heart tone changes was lower in women receiving laminaria than other methods of mechanical or um, prostaglandin or oxytocin. The C-section rate was similar, and in the addition of prostaglandins or oxytocin to laminaria, laminaria um, during ripening did not appear to improve outcomes. So we know that when we put a folia bulb and we give pros, um, pitocin at the same time that we have a quicker expulsion rate, we did not see this with laminaria. Questions on that? Comments? It's not something I've ever used. So, um, the next, we have oxytocin, which is, of course, the love hormone, hence the little hearts. Um, oxytocin or pitocin, which is a synthetic form of oxytocin, is what we uh, commonly use in induction. Um, that causes um, the uterus to contract, which activates the G-protein coupled receptors, and it triggers this intracellular calcium, uh, calcium levels, um, which causes that contraction in the uterine myofibrils. Um, Pitocin also increases local prostaglandin production, um, so which th further stimulates contractions. So there is some benefit to giving um, Pitocin um, for prostaglandin or ripening, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the risk of Pitocin are mostly dose dependent. We all know this, the more pit you give, the more chance you have for tachycystole or abnormal fetal heart rate tracings. tracings. Tachycystole can lead to abruption, can also lead to uterine rupture. None of those, of course, are good. And very rarely, and I've never seen, knock on wood, um, water intoxication if we give them a lot, especially in a hypotonic solution, which is not really how we give PIT. Um, PIT dosages vary depending on what the patient needs. Um, so there's a super, super low, um, which we use for cervical ripening, a low regimen, and a high dose regimen. So when we look at um, using Pitocin for cervical ripening, the protocols kind of vary in the, in the literature, but essentially Pitocin is run at four to six uh, milliunits per minute for up to 12 to 24 hours, or as long as they're needed. So if the woman is ripe within six hours, then it's um, then routine, um, lower, higher dose uh, Pitocin regimens are used. So compared to PGE2 gel, Pitocin shows no difference in the likelihood of being in labor having a favorable Bishop score and no difference in the likelihood of a vaginal delivery. However, gel was associated with a shorter time to delivery, so it probably works a little quicker and a little better, but also there's increased risk of heart rate changes and hyperstimulations. And then there's also another good study I looked at comparing meso to pit. Um, and there are equally effective in cervical ripening, though more issues with tachycystole and fetal heart rate changes in the meso group. So it is an option for cervical ripening, especially in the appropriate patients that maybe we can't give prostaglandins to. And here are the studies that talk about those. So the other two regimens for dosing that we talk about are the low dose and the high dose. 
Um, low dose is essentially less frequent increases with lower rates. So starting at a 0.5 to 2 MU per minute, it's increasing by 1 to 2 every 15 to 40. This is very similar to what we use at Sinai. Um, some facilities, though, where you will use high dose regimens, um, which were um, associated with um, a shorter labor and less cases of choreo, but higher rates of C-section um, for uterine tachycystole and fetal heart rate changes. And that is starting the Pitocin at six MUs per minute and increasing um, by every three to six by every 15 to 40 minutes. So this three to six is, it's really increasing by six every 15 to 40, but if they're having some problems then you only increase it by three really is what that three to six range comes on. And then it's put here on the bottom, the maximum dose of Pitocin has not been established. So I know at Sinai we have, I think it's 25 in our orders, but there's not really been a great dose. There are some places where they'll go up to 40 or 45, um, especially in these higher dose regimens. If we talk about Pitocin alone for induction, so without ripening, um, it is increased with unsuccessful vaginal delivery. Um, Pitocin alone significantly increases the number of women requiring epidural. And com Pitocin compared to prostaglandins, there was an increase in unsuccessful vaginal delivery in 24 hours, as well as an increase in C-section, which makes a lot of sense. The exception to the rule is if somebody is ruptured. So if you have term prom and they're not in labor, the literature still shows um, like Pitocin versus like a buccal mesoprostol that Pitocin, IV Pitocin is the quickest way to delivery for women who are um, ruptured. And then amniotomy, which I probably should have put before oxytocin, which I didn't, but so here it is. Amniotomy is another way to rupture or another way to induce women. It's known as ARAM, of course. Um, the problem with AROMing alone for induction is that it can be really unpredictable when your contractions are going to start. And sometimes we can see this really long interval between amniotomy and actually the onset of contractions. And so when we're worried about risk about infection and chorioamnionitis, I think that amniotomy alone is something that you need to be very cautious with. Um, there are some studies that show amniotomy with immediate um, Pitocin at the same time resulted in less um, prolonged intervals to delivery than those who delay Pitocin. So if you rupture them and wait and then end up starting Pitocin later, that of course interval is longer to delivery, which is, makes a lot of sense. Nicole. The difference, yes? It's 1040. Oh crap, I'm almost done. Um, the difference is of course amniotomy, God that goes because I'm the next one, so finish up. Okay, are you okay, Amy? I'll go quickly and then they can read the rest of the slides. The thing I just wanna say about amniotomy is that of course, um, amniotomy during induction of labor is different. Um, so it's generally accepted that amniotomy during an induction decreases the duration of labor. So amniotomy alone for induction, does not, it extends it. Amniotomy during induction um, does speed delivery. Um, and then let me just really quickly, I won't go the road, you guys can read through the rest of the amniotomy stuff. Induction for fetal demise, um, it's not something that I spent a lot of time on, but really to know that the use of mesoprostol between 24 and 28 weeks is still um, safe and effective. Um, before 28 weeks, vaginal mesoprostol appears to be um, most efficient, but high dose PIT is also accepted. Um, typical doses are 200 to 400 micrograms vaginally, um, and you can use up to 400 micrograms every six hours with stillbirths, um, up to 28 weeks with a, prior, um, with a prior uterine scar, and the research shows it does not uh, increase your risk for complications. After 28 weeks, usual induction protocols and you can use a Foley catheter in women with a prior uterine score, uh, scar, sorry. Um, outpatient ripening, you all know we're working at outpatient Foley. Um, so there are good uh, research that shows that outpatient ripening is safe and efficacious. And then the last thing that I just need to spend a couple minutes on Emmy and then I'll be done is um, failed induction of labor. So we need to know when to diagnose in, um, a failed induction. 
um, making sure that you're giving adequate time to enter labor, especially in obese women who we know take longer to labor and they don't respond in the typical manner to typical doses of induction medicine. So making sure that we're really giving adequate labor, not diagnosing um, active phase until six centimeters. Um, and then a diagnosis of a rest disorder should not be made unless the woman has entered that active phase of labor. So you shouldn't say that it's labor arrest instead of failed induction if they haven't hit six centimeters. And then what's important to remember with induction is that if mom and baby are doing fine and we don't anticipate either of them becoming sick, it's okay to keep going if everyone is doing fine. And then here's the definition of failed induction. You can read that on your own. And then here's a nice study about turning Pitocin off during induction, um, uh, comparing women who were ruptured an hour later had Pitocin stopped, and then the other group had Pitocin continued at the rate that they had it at at that time. And they found that the, the group that had Pitocin stopped after rupture actually had shorter times to delivery than women who continued on their same rate of Pitocin. So that's just my interesting study for the day. And that's it. Questions? Thank you. Yep. Okay, everybody get a quick bathroom break. Emmy, I'll open up the next meeting. We'll get you set to go and then we'll reconvene. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you.